So good morning, everybody, and just an enormous welcome to the VNA. Delighted to see the lecture theatre, the original Victorian lecture theatre, so full of all of you, and particularly to see so many practitioners. So it's a treat for me to be talking about ironwork to people who actually know about working with the stuff. Um, so huge welcome. And I wanted to say the director, Tristram Hunt, uh, of the VNA is away today, but he knows all about the event and is again very, very excited. He knew about how many people were coming. So a great welcome from him personally. And just to clarify, I'm senior curator of the Ironwork Collection, not of all metalwork. I've got some terrific colleagues in metalwork and obviously work very closely with them. And I'm not a conservator, but we are thrilled and so privileged to have a very, very talented conservation team within the VNA Museum. So I feel I'm representing them standing here while sadly a lot of them are still working away in the studios today. So here's the original main entrance to the VNA. This is where you used to come in originally. Um, and the V&A was founded from the profits of the Great Exhibition of 1851, basically to inspire and to educate. So to inspire the public, to inspire practitioners, and also to bring about um, a joining together more closely of art and industry, so that objects that were made and even mass-produced objects were still very beautifully designed. So design is at the heart of the V&A and what we do. The V&A had the first public restaurant, and uh, that is directly underneath us, which uh, I hope you'll see uh, later on. Don't miss the enameled iron ceiling. Very practical, Victorians. Let's be able to clean it. We'll have ceramic tiles, and we'll have an enameled iron ceiling, which is spectacular. So I'm going to give you a very, very brief overview of the V&A, what we do, the armwork collection, and then focus on the main subject. So here's a very well-attended lecture on the artwork collection in the museum in 1870. So I'm, I'm pleased to be following this historic precedent, but I do feel a bit underdressed in comparison to this chap here. Uh, but I'm delighted, of course, to have PowerPoint. Can you imagine lecturing on ironwork and having to lug the stuff to where you're speaking? I can't quite believe how they did this. So back to the v &A and what we curators do. We do many, many things, as you can imagine, but it's broadly looking after, displaying, and interpreting the collections and working with colleagues in other departments uh, in order to do this. So our work very simply includes curatorship, so that's looking after collections, working with conservation, collections management, keeping track of all the objects and uh, acquisitions, displays, and so on, and research when we have time, which is always a treat, and sharing expertise with learning programs. And the galleries are broadly in two types. So art and design are the very, very best works of art in a particular place, in the, from a particular place in the world, and a particular time. And materials and techniques is where you want to really immerse yourself in studying, in my case, ironwork. And over the years, the v &A floor plan has changed. You can imagine, as we enhance the displays, as we change the focus of the gallery spaces. And so the galleries have been rethought and modernized and enhanced. I was really thrilled to find this 1908 floor plan from the Committee of Rearrangement of that date. And I was interested to see the ground floor then was devoted to galleries of metalwork, woodwork, stone, marble. So a real emphasis on those materials. And in the West Court, which I've arrowed with that rather um, ghastly blue arrow, but I wanted to do that to highlight the fact that we had blacksmith's work around the walls. So that is put on the floor plan, so very proudly displaying our ironwork collections from the very earliest days. But today, the ironwork gallery is displayed in six materials and techniques galleries, and they run literally from west to east across the entire museum. And uh, the very best examples, though, of, uh, for instance, earlier British artwork is in the British galleries. At one end, you can see my rather awful scribbles on the left. And then you continue through, and the very earliest examples are in the medieval and Renaissance galleries at the other end. So artwork is dotted around in these art and design galleries in the V&A as well. And right in the center is the wonderful Hereford screen, where I met some of you yesterday. A bit more on that soon. So the current arrangement dates from the 1990s, so with all credit to my predecessor in ironwork, Marion Campbell and Eric Turner, Tessa Murdoch, all sorts of people in the metalwork team who were responsible for it, working with John Renane, the designer. So the collection very broadly uh, spans from medieval to modern, so pre-medieval metalwork is at the British Museum, and our collection continues up to the present with many thanks to donors so these two objects sort of bookend our collection. So on the left, St. Albans Abbey 
wonderful hinge of the late 12th century, and on the right, Fire Imp by Tony Robinson of 1974, which is purposefully modern, but using a, a traditional techniques, as I know many of you still do. And it was exhibited in Towards a New Iron Age, so that was the last time the v &A really made a huge, big fuss about ironwork, some of you will remember, with an exhibition. Um, and again, Marion Campbell gets the credit for, for that. And it was celebrating contemporary iron making as we are today. So we also have small, intricate steel objects, uh, locks and keys. I love the puzzle padlock on the right. You literally have to get the combination right, and then those little hands spring apart, and only then do you get to get to the, to the key. Uh, to large-scale ironwork. So here is the magnificent Hereford screen weighing about nine tons, which brings me to my main subject, challenges and innovation. So much ironwork restoration has been done across the UK by all sorts of bodies, not least thanks to the NHIG, and many, many congratulations on their 10th anniversary and for all the work they do. So most of it is very carefully researched these days in terms of the historic uh, ironwork itself. So the questions you might consider, how much of the original surface is left? How much could be saved? How much could be protected? What's the desired outcome? What's the current function, if any, of the building or, the, or uh, of the architectural ironwork in particular? Is it in situ or is it in museum? And what are the objectives of those institutions? Chronology and history is obviously taken into account, um, but I think pragmatism. I believe that the color scheme of the Albert Bridge, which you can see on the right, was chosen because it was the most visible one for boats at night. And over the years, the V&A has been involved in all sorts of projects, whether it's individual objects, like the Nuremberg gates on the left in the Art Galleries, or Apsley House railings, which involved a lot of other external people. The building was and is run by the nation, and the V&A used to run the museum inside it. And on the right, the wonderful Guimar screen, so bringing a little touch of green. Um, the late Duke of Wellington, who lives at Apsley House, said, oh, well, the railings were always black. Um, and of course, they weren't. In the 1770s, they were green. And the Hereford Cathedral screen was by far and away the most expensive and complicated restoration project ever carried out by the V&A, with many thanks to James Joel and to all the donors, without whom it simply wouldn't have been possible. And a range of specialists were involved. I think some of you are probably here today, so do come up and say hello and congratulations that we still enjoy your wonderful work. Uh, so it, it arrived at the museum um, in 14,000 pieces in 46 crates. And uh, my predecessor, Marion Campbell, said it was like doing a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle without the picture on the box. Uh, so 250 paint samples were taken, 20 colors, and so on. And here is a sort of before and after uh, images, and there are some of the stats, but uh, all of this is actually online. So if you look at British Art Studies online, ISI 5, there's quite a lot of information about the screen and indeed on our website. And I wanted to show some of the colours and some of Skidmore's typical sort of punching and incising up close. So some of the colours were uh, on the screen when it was originally in the International Exhibition of 1862, and then more colours, yet more colours, were added in 1863 when it went to the cathedral. Um, and poor old Skidmore, the metal worker, did a deal with the cathedral. So if he was allowed to exhibit it in 1862, he wouldn't charge the cathedral as much. Um, poor old Skidmore died in poverty, so I always champion his work. He's really breathtaking what he produced and uh, I enjoyed these close-ups so this is post restoration and a close-up because I wanted to highlight this particular object is iron in conjunction with other materials so we've got burnished brass hard stones mosaics foil back glass which glints in the light enamel paints electroformed copper figures which was then very very innovative this is the very early days of electrometallurgy so innovation in the original was, was, is not new today. Obviously, the Victorians were right up in there with their photography, electrometallurgy, and so on. So bring us a bit more up to date. This is in 2013. We were given this, this cross by Salisbury Cathedral. In fact, and I haven't got a slide with a spire behind it, but it was in one of their storerooms, and they incredibly generously gave it to us. And it was from their cathedral screen, also designed by George Gilbert Scott, also made by Skidmore. And this became a major restoration project, spearheaded by my brilliant colleague, Donna Stevens, who I think is here today. Welcome, Donna. And all credit is due to Donna's tenacity with the support of Joe Worley in the studio, who allowed Donna to get really stuck into this object, um, and also to Zoe Allen, our uh, gilding specialist. 
So we discovered, Donna discovered, that the panels were not only iron, but also brass. So you can see the copper sneaking its way through uh, with uh, the condition that we inherited the cross in. It was separated laboriously into, into, into its component parts, x-rayed in sections, which Don arranged, and then piecing together those x-rays so that we could see where all the screws were. So that in itself is pretty innovative with an object of this size. And remember that copper alloy leaf bottom right. Because we then went digital. So Don commissioned 3D scanning of each one of the two types of these leaves. These quirky leaves sort of flew out uh, right and left from the cross itself. Very high level, so incredible to have this detail so high up. Um, but uh, having had them scanned, we had uh, positives, as it were, cast in resin, and of course marked VNA 2016, which I don't think the Victorians ever bothered to mark their restoration, so it's quite fun trying to work out what restoration was done to our collection in the 19th century. Quite difficult to tell, but of course now we've got ethics and we will mark it. And then from these resin leaves, we cast these uh, brass replacement ones, which were then burnished to look like the original. So we were very much trying to recreate the spectacular Victorian ironwork. And keeping the big picture of the whole cross, so moving away from the individual leaves, um, we decided to use dry ice to clean the cross, piece by piece. So this is um, an amazing technique, using a compressor connected to a dry ice machine with a nozzle outlet, a bit like a hair dryer, really. And you blast the surface of the iron, you can see top right, with very small crystals of ice, which you have to get delivered, and obviously you hope they stay as crystals, it's not so great in the hot summer. Um, and then you blast them with very high pressure, they sublimate as they hit the surface, and they cause absolutely no damage at all to the iron, and instead they simply lift off the debris and dirt. So it's just miraculous when you draw the nozzle across the surface of the iron, and you get to see the original surface underneath all that dirt and grime. So it's a lot of kit, but it's miraculous. And then, of course, the laborious uh, painting, uh, the paint and the gold leaf. So this is a bit more traditional, obviously matching the original 19th century choices with exactly that red, which is a very typical Skidmore 1860s Venetian red, and matching it and also matching, of course, the, the gold leaf. So there's all sorts of different, you could say, colours in gold leaf. So um, Zoe was very much part of that. And you can see the result in the galleries and indeed on the right. And if you want to know more about this, do Google Salisbury Cross Restoration because there's a little clip on YouTube which actually, where we all talk about this collaborative project, as I say, with me, but very much uh, credit to all the conserv conservators who worked on this so brilliantly. So moving on to my final case study, as it were, today, I wanted to show you how you can then take dry ice on a really, really big scale. So having, uh, as, it's, as, as it were, dramatically cleaned the cross piece by piece, we were then here dealing with the remains of a spectacular rotunda. So on the left, you can see the rotunda that was the, in the heart of the coal exchange. And it was opened to great acclaim by Prince Albert, who went down the Thames by barge to open it. And uh, it was incredibly celebrated. So this was innovative ironwork in terms of architecture. 1849, so of course before the, the Great Exhibition in Crystal Palace. And the rotunda itself was made of sections, massive sections of cast iron, which were joined together. And, but it was like the Hereford Cathedral screen. It's the saddest story. It went out of favor. It was demolished. In fact, John Betjeman stood in the middle of that rotunda and tried to save it in the 1960s, but it was demolished. And the v &A had uh, four sections that we were given by the demolition contractor. And I saw them when I took over the armor collection. And they were not in great condition, as you can see on the left. They were not only rusty, but actually we spotted that there was damage from fire and uh, wondered if this was from the original demolition. So it was an incredible challenge to be faced with this astonishingly uh, badly damaged surface. Donna got to work again. So here we are actually in our store at Blythe House and outside, uh, working away very hard last summer and gradually exposing the original surface of the iron. You can see sort of work in progress with that section that's there. 
and I got to have a go too. I wasn't going to stand back and just watch it happening. Uh, so that's me in action on the left, closely monitored by Donna. Um, and then, of course, you have an exposed iron surface. And of course, you can see the structure. We could see the original bolts. We could see how beautifully the building had been cast. But we had to protect it. So uh, it was then painted with rust converter and primer paints in order to protect the surface. And I would love to hear from any of you who have more experience with, with these sort of paints, because it didn't entirely work. And I'm sorry to say there are slightly uh, small areas creeping in of some rust coming back again. But anyway, we've done our best, and it'll certainly be restored again properly. Uh, and the result was here. And again, great credit to our technical services team. As you know, moving ironwork is a challenge. And when you've got these astonishing monsters of at least four or five tons each, uh, you have to enlist a lot of specialist help to move them and even just to turn them over so we could start working on the other side. But it was a very successful restoration. And I'm certainly hoping that these four sections that we've got will be uh, not only uh, completely painted as a, with a top coat, the original color, but also erected together in, as an archway so you can actually see the scale and the ambition of Victorian ironwork. And I've concentrated on Victorian ironwork because that's what I've worked in, but at the, uh, in this afternoon, I'm very happy to lead you all to the ironwork galleries where you will, of course, see much more wrought iron and including, of course, from the golden age of wrought iron of the 18th century. We have got incredibly spectacular collections in our ironwork galleries. But as my last image uh, before, I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, this is a secret, little hidden away part of the Viennese architecture. So there is a little tiny door that, that you can have a look at this, which are, is the remains of the South Court. So this is in the northeast quarter of the VNA, and it's the last part of the museum that hasn't yet been opened up, uh, which is a project that's ongoing. VNA Future Plan, which we've been working on for 20, 30 years or so, has been to open up the architecture of the museum, so to really appreciate what we've got here, whether it's wrought iron or cast iron uh, or riveted rolled iron um, here bolted together in sections. Um, so the ironwork collection isn't just in the galleries, it's all around you. It's actually on the lodges of the lecture theatre, it's on the staircase coming up here. So you can see ironwork everywhere in the building. Um, but this, as I say, is hidden away, and this I'm going to leave. This is my last slide because I wanted to leave this as a sort of open question. So we've looked at it, we've got a little pathway you can see where some of us have gone up um, and had a look and the interior would have been spectacular. So on the bottom left you can see a computer generated uh, reimagining of what this South Court would have looked like. So rolled and riveted uh, iron, painted deep, deep blue, stencil decoration, so rather like the Hereford screen has got stencil decoration on the bottom. This had stenciled gold decoration on that blue, and it had twisted uh, brown painted columns on the bottom, which people were very rude about, called them candy cane and bedposts at one stage. Um, but we are going to be assessing this because this is uh, where I hope we will be able to display some of our 19th century collections uh, e eventually, sometime in the 2020s, including the cast iron rotunda sections from the coal exchange. So that's it from me very briefly. I've had to cut it short so that we can keep to time. But uh, I will be on hand now if there are any questions, if I can hear. I don't know if we've got microphones for questions. Um, but otherwise, as I say, very, very happy to take you all to the Armut Galleries at 4.40 this afternoon. So you can follow me then. So thank you again so much for coming. I know some of you have come from quite a distance. You've put up with traffic. Um, and as I say, a particular welcome to the practitioners today and students of blacksmithing. You are the future. Thank you. So I can just about see you if anybody's got any burning questions so far. Otherwise, of course, come and find me later. Jeff, far away. <laughs> no, Jeff has a microphone. Wonderful. Can anybody hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, how do you, uh, that you know, proposed restoration, uh, I would call it, uh, rather, uh, is will look absolutely fantastic. When you're actually considering um, tr the treatment that you're going to give your collection, um, how do you balance maintaining the historical record of the degradation of the piece over time 
as balanced against any new works that you do to it? That's a terrific question, and I partially answered it yesterday to some of those uh, of you who were on my tour, so that is absolutely brilliant question. Um, so we have a set of, of conservation principles. So very specifically, conservation versus restoration. Of course, we all know they're very different. And I think we start off by asking the questions, which I whizzed over rather fast at the beginning of my talk. What remains? What of the original surface remains? Uh, what are we trying to do? But I think we would always do less rather than more if we possibly could. So I'm, as I say, speaking on behalf of conservators, and I'm sorry that the V&A team is not all here, but some of them are. You can ask them later on. Um, but as I say, we would assess it together, and wherever possible, we would protect what is there. So part of uh, the condition in which we inherit the objects, whether we buy them or we're given them, uh, that's part of their story. So, for instance, with the cross, the Salisbury cross I showed you, the upper part of the arms we've left exactly as we inherited that cross, but just protecting with perspex so they don't get dust all over them. Uh, and uh, the rest of the, and the Hereford screen, for instance, there was a protective layer, so you can always go back. Now, the problem as uh, conservators will know, is sometimes it's impossible to clean the top without in some way possibly interfering with, with what's underneath. So we have an issue with the gates from the Salisbury screen. So they're on display next to the cross. So do have a look at them. And it's a conversation in progress. We've tried to do test cleaning by hand, but you know how laborious that is, to reveal the original gold leaf underneath. And so what we might do with the gates, not yet decided, is do a protective layer on one side and then paint new paint and gilding. So you will see, which I think we have a duty in a museum, you will see how magnificent the gates were. But on the other side, leave them as they were. So the Salisbury gates were painted in the 1970s with bronze paint. And the problem is, of course, when you take that off, you're taking off the original gold leaf, which I'm not happy to do at all. So we're very careful. So it's each object we talk very, very carefully about as a case-by-case -case basis, involving my colleagues in furniture and interior design, as it was used to be called, certainly, of course, the conservators and me. So we're all coming at it with a shared uh, agenda, as it were, to try and protect whatever we possibly can um, before doing something radical. So we would only do rest. So when I said the South Court, I'm very careful to say we're not necessarily restoring that. That's a conversation. It could be conserved. It could be restored. It could be a mixture. It's, we're very, very, very early on in, in that discussion. So no decisions have been made. And of course, there's funding implications for whatever we choose as well. But thank you for asking that. That is the very good question, because it's a very hard one. And as I say, I wouldn't make a blanket rule at all. Yes, Jeff. Following on from that, um, on the coal exchange iron work, was there some damaged, fire damaged paint work? And if so, did you preserve it? And if so, how? Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. On the coal exchange yes. iron work, yep. was there fire damaged paint? And if so, did you preserve it? And if so, how? Uh, the, so the coal exchange, some of the paint. 99% of the paint was literally sort of lifting off the surface. So the section you saw there, we think was probably damaged as part of the demolition. So the fire at low level, um, so fire would have damaged the paintwork. So yes, we've kept samples of the paint, we analyzed the paint. We've got part of the conservation department here is science conservation, so I should have mentioned them. And they do a terrific work in terms of analyzing the paint, which a lot of you do professionally anyway, but actually working out what the different layers were. And with the coal exchange, it was always painted cream. But in fact, the top surface was, we think, probably painted in the 1950s or so. So it wasn't the original surface. Um, so yes, so that has is, that is coloured what we've done. And it was red at low level, actually, quite interesting. So I think they were quite practical. So the, the bottom half, of course, is where you rub against it. There were offices off that rotunda. So actually the bottom part was painted red, and we did analyse the original red paint. I was just wondering whether any of the damaged paint was kept to show that the uh, exchange did actually go through a fire. I don't think it went through a fire. I, in fact, I'm 99% sure it didn't. It was, it was demolished in 1962. We know that. That's all documented. Um, and uh, I know who the demolition contractor was. I think a lot of times these demolition contractors I feel really sorry for because I think they really care about what they were doing. Certainly with the Hereford screen, we know that. The man who took that apart tried to say, I can make anything for you from the Hereford screen. I can make 
bedposts, I can make lampstands, I can make wall brackets, let's not destroy this. And certainly in 1962, there was a massive heated debate about the coal exchange, which, which was one of the cases that brought about the foundation of the Victorian Society. And if anybody from the Victorian Society is here, hallelujah to you, you know, they do a terrific job in terms of preserving what we have got. Thank you. I think we've probably got time for one more question, if we've got one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask um, how you decide what to have in the collection. I mean, are you being given things regularly? Um, do you turn much away? Um, yeah. So that's a very good question. So historically, in fact, there's a little, there's a bit of information in the artwork galleries about how we have acquired objects in the collection. Um, so sometimes it's if a house is being demolished, um, and then. Obviously, it's a, very, it's a very difficult balance between space. We can't display all the collection as it is. We display most of it, but ironwork, as you know, is quite large. Um, but certainly, we've got some of the very best examples of 18th century ironwork has been acquired as a result of the demolition of buildings, uh, as the 19th century is here. Um, so we have very, 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 very limited funds for acquisitions. So on the whole, we don't buy objects very often because we are, in a friendly way, of course, competing with our colleagues in other departments. So I'm part of sculpture, metalworks, ceramics and glass, but there's also textiles and fashion. There's the National Art Library, Word and Image. You know, there are a lot of other departments uh, in the museum. So sometimes we will put forward a case for acquiring something that's absolutely exceptional, and then I will write a justification. But on the whole, I have to say, we've been very lucky to be given pieces. Um, so, and do we turn things away? Well, uh, Eric Turner is my brilliant colleague who's been a specialist in 20th century and 21st century metalwork for many years. So Eric uh, is, a, is a great person to judge that. And that's a difficult question because, of course, looking back, we might have a slightly different opinion, maybe in 50 years' time. But on the whole, we have to make the best judgment we can that the work represents the V&A's principles, which is the very best workmanship, the very best design, uh, the very best techniques and materials shown to the public. Thank you. Thank you very much.